Number 8. The RMS Republic The British Royal Mail ship known as the RMS Republic was built in Belfast, United Kingdom in 1903. The vessel was especially popular among the ultra-wealthy, earning it the nickname of the Millionaire's Ship. During the early morning hours on January 24, 1909, the Republic encountered a thick fog off the Nantucket coast. The crew slowed the ship down and constantly blew whistles to alert any nearby vessels of their presence. Despite these safety measures, the Republic collided with a steamship called the SS Florida, killing seven people between both ships. The Republic's surviving passengers were transferred to the less damaged Florida. Historians often credit the crew's hasty evacuation efforts and their cooperation with one another for the low number of fatalities. The Republic disappeared beneath the surface the following day, making her the largest ship ever to sink at the time. Ever since, rumors have circulated about a stash of treasure and gold coins going down with the Republic. At the time of the sinking, the hoard was supposedly worth somewhere between $250,000 and $3 million. If that's true, then it means that the goods could be worth up to $1 billion today. Treasure hunter Martin Bayerl located the wreck in 1981. Then in 1987, he raised two and a half million dollars from investors to fund an expedition to the vessel in hopes of finding the hoard of valuables. And while his team made some fascinating discoveries, including a room filled with hundreds of bottles of 19th century wine and champagne, they didn't find the treasure. Bayerl was subsequently forced to give up the search due to a lack of funding. Naturally, others who were eager to get their hands on the gold petitioned the court for permission to explore the wreck. But a Massachusetts judge ruled that Bayerl and his son Grant possessed exclusive rights to the wreckage. It's unclear whether they plan to continue looking for the treasure, and nobody even knows for sure whether it exists. At number 7. The USS Oriskany since the development of the aircraft carrier in the years following World War I, the United States Navy has had more of them than any other country. The American military also owns the world's largest modern aircraft carriers. The country's fascination with these massive warships dates back to the 1920s, but the production of U.S. aircraft carriers picked up noticeably throughout World War II. One of the many warships that were built during this period was the 888-foot-long USS Oriskany. It entered service right after the war ended and operated primarily in the Pacific until the 1970s. The Oriskany served both in the Vietnam and the Korean War and was awarded a total of 12 battle stars between both conflicts. In 1966, someone accidentally lit a magnesium flare aboard the ship and a catastrophic fire broke out, ending in the death of 47 crew members. The vessel was retired from service in 1976 and it sat for nearly 20 years before being sold as scrap in 1995. However, the buyer didn't do anything with the deteriorating ship, and it continued to decay with an uncertain future. The Oriskany was repossessed from its owner in 1997 and bounced around between shipyards in California and Texas while the Navy tried to decide what to do with it. They ultimately chose to sink it off the coast of Florida in the Gulf of Mexico as an artificial reef. Then, in 2004, the ship was towed to Pensacola, where Navy scientists performed human health studies and ecological tests to ensure that the Oriskany would pose no dangers to marine life or the environment after being placed on the ocean floor. A Navy team sank the vessel two years later in 2006, finally giving it a home after withering away for decades as an unwanted eyesore. Number 6. The Mayflower in 1620, 132 passengers and crew members boarded a wooden ship called the Mayflower and set sail from England headed for North America. Around 40 of the passengers were Protestant separatists who had broken away from the Church of England and were seeking a new life, free from religious persecution. They called themselves saints, and we know them today as pilgrims. The voyage was difficult, and the Mayflower arrived in America nearly two months later than originally planned. The pilgrims began building a settlement called Plymouth Colony in what is now the state of Massachusetts, but they soon realized that they were woefully unprepared for the brutal cold and blizzards they encountered. During that first winter, half of the pilgrims died from exposure, starvation, and disease. Unfortunately, the ground was so frozen they couldn't grow food. They lacked adequate shelter and were forced to live inside the Mayflower, where they suffered from deadly outbreaks of tuberculosis, scurvy, and pneumonia. The settlers also forgot to bring their fishing rods with them because they 
were so eager to leave. If it weren't for the help they received from Native Americans, it's likely none of the pilgrims would have survived until spring. Indigenous locals taught the newcomers how to gather food and survive in the wilderness, enabling some of them to narrowly avoid death. The Mayflower returned to England the following year. Records suggest that it was last seen in 1624 in the Thames River following the death of its captain, Christopher Jones, two years earlier. It was apparently abandoned and forgotten about in the river until one of the Mayflower's owners applied for an appraisal of the ship in May of that same year. Tradition claims that the vessel was dismantled and a barn was built out of its timbers. But this has never been proven, and the Mayflower's fate remains a mystery to this day. At number 5, the RMS Lusitania. The 787-foot-long RMS Lusitania was the world's largest luxury ocean liner when she embarked on her maiden voyage from Queenstown, Ireland to Sandy Hook, New Jersey in 1907. For the next seven years, she transported thousands of first, second, and third-class passengers back and forth between Europe and North America. The ship's first-class accommodations were top-notch and included a lavish dining room spanning two decks, a smoking room, a reading and writing room, an exquisite lounge, and a music area and more. These high-end spaces boasted carved mahogany panels, gilded wallpaper, imposing Corinthian columns, and other excessively expensive decor. Second class came with fewer amenities, as well as smaller and more basic spaces. It was more average than anything, but it was still nice and comfortable and gave passengers plenty of options for places to hang out. But it was the third class that made the Lusitania's owners the most money. It was popular among immigrants and was known for having nicer and more spacious third class accommodations than other transatlantic ocean liners at the time. When World War I broke out in 1914, many passenger vessels went out of service due to safety concerns. The Lusitania received a drab gray paint job to make her less noticeable and conceal her identity, and continued to operate commercially even as concerns rose about the growing threat of German submarines. On May 7, 1915, the ship was struck by a torpedo just 11 miles off the Irish coast. She was nearing the end of her 200 second crossing when she began to run aground and list from the damage. Just 18 minutes after being hit, the Lusitania slipped beneath the waves. This resulted in the deaths of nearly 1,200 of the 1,962 passengers and crew members aboard the vessel. Many of the survivors were praised for springing into action to help save others. Irish rescuers who responded to the ship's distress call were also commended for their bravery. German officials defended the decision to sink a passenger ship and claimed no responsibility for the lives that were lost. But the attack sparked widespread outrage among civilians in several countries, especially Britain and the US. This incident brought America one step closer to getting involved in the war. Would you rather travel by boat or by plane? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Number 4. The USS Constitution the 204-foot-long USS Constitution, named Old Ironsides, was a three-masted wooden warship known as a frigate. It was built in Boston, Massachusetts during the 1790s for the United States Navy, and it was one of six original frigates that Congress approved the construction of after America won its independence from Britain. As one of the designated capital vessels of the young country's navy, the Constitution and its sister ships were larger and more heavily armed than standard frigates of the time. Upon entering service in 1797, the Constitution's first assignment was to protect merchant ships from the French during an unofficial naval conflict known as the Quasi-War. The vessel was also tasked with defeating Barbary pirates in the First Barbary War. However, the ship is best remembered for its service during the War of 1812 against Great Britain. Throughout the conflict, the Constitution defeated four British warships and captured numerous merchant vessels. Over the following decades, the ship traveled all over the world, carrying out various assignments for the Navy. During the American Civil War, the U.S. Naval Academy used the Constitution as a training ship. Her more than 80-year career came to an end in 1881, when she was retired from service. In 1907, the Constitution was designated as a museum ship, and then in 1934, she embarked on a three-year-long nationwide tour, stopping at 90 ports along the way. It's surprising that the Constitution was still intact on her 200th birthday in 1997. Then, in 2012, the ship sailed under her own power to mark the anniversary of her victory against the French Navy ship, the HMS Guerriere. Today, the vessel continues to operate as a museum under the direction of active duty naval officers and crew. The Constitution is currently the oldest ship in the world that's still afloat.
Number three, the Santa Maria. The 77-foot-long Santa Maria was the largest of the three ships that Christopher Columbus commanded on his famed expedition to North America in 1492. Columbus obtained the vessel after convincing its owner and captain, Castilian mapmaker Juan de la Cosa, to assist with his journeys to the so-called New World. Some historians believe that Columbus couldn't have carried out his missions without de la Cosa's help. But in an unsurprising display of the shameless arrogance that Columbus remains notorious for to this day, the explorer Explorer's diaries lack any mention of due credit to De La Cosa for his sponsorship. The men ran the Santa Maria together as the flagship of the flotilla, sailing alongside Columbus's smaller ships, the Nina and the Pinta. The two men learned during the journey that they didn't like each other very much, and they disagreed on which one of them had the rightful command over the Santa Maria, as the ship's admiral Columbus was technically in charge. However, he still found ways to overstep boundaries, and his crew was also disobedient. Delicosa, on the other hand, believed that as the vessel's captain, he deserved more decision-making power than he was given. But when an inexperienced crew member ran the Santa Maria aground off the coast of what is now Haiti on Christmas Day, they no longer had a ship to fight over. Columbus wanted to try salvaging the ship, but Delicosa refused to cooperate and sought refuge on the Nina. Acting under Columbus's orders, the crew dismantled the vessel and used the timber to construct a fort along the island's coast called Villa de la Navidad. Three weeks after after constructing the fort, Columbus headed back to Spain aboard the Nina and left 39 sailors at the site of Villa de la Navidad. But when he returned the next year, all of the inhabitants of the fort were nowhere to be found. Historical records suggest that the settlement was destroyed at some point, and modern experts are still searching to find any trace of it. Number 2. The USS New Jersey the USS New Jersey was built in the 1940s as an Iowa-class battleship for the U.S. Navy. These formidable war machines were designed to intercept the fastest enemy warships and to act as a fast wing in traditional battle alongside slower naval ships. Unlike most of the Navy's other vessels, they were capable of keeping up with aircraft carriers and operating ahead of the rest of the fleet. As the Navy's first vessels that were specifically engineered for speed, the 880-foot-long New Jersey and its sister ships were the fastest fastest battleships ever built. Each vessel was powered by eight boilers and four steam turbines, giving it the strength that it needed to maintain a high speed over long distances. The Iowa-class vessels were decommissioned and mothballed during the 1950s. In 1968, the New Jersey came out of retirement to serve in the Vietnam War. During a shakedown cruise to test its performance before going overseas, Captain J. Edward Snyder pushed the engines to their limits. The ship topped out at 40 miles per hour and maintained this speed for six hours. When Captain Snyder ordered the crew to hit the brakes full force, the ship continued to move for two miles before stopping. Due to their historic value, all four Iowa-class ships were restored, and most of them were turned into museum ships throughout the U.S. The New Jersey was donated to the Home Port Alliance in Camden and was converted into a museum ship in October of 2001, where it remains to this day. Number 1. The HMS Victory the English-built warship, the HMS Victory, served under dozens of captains and admirals throughout her decades-long career with the Royal Navy. She first saw combat in 1778 during an encounter with the French in the English Channel, known as the First Battle of Ushant. Two years later, the Victory helped intercept a French naval fleet off the coast of Brittany in the Second Battle of Ushant. In 1782, the vessel guided a merchant convoy into Gibraltar in order to replenish their supplies in the event of a French and Spanish military blockade. Luckily, they didn't encounter any resistance upon entering the Straits, and they successfully unloaded the supplies. Then, in 1797, she fought against the Spanish in the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, followed by the 1805 Battle of Trafalgar, which both ended with British victories. The victory was heavily damaged at Trafalgar, and she spent the next several decades serving as a troop ship, a floating depot, a prison ship, and a school. Public campaigns saved the ship from being dismantled and ultimately led to her restoration as a museum. After more than 244 years of service, Service, she's the world's oldest naval vessel still in commission as of 2022. Which of these famous ships was your favorite? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.